just to follow through with what Bob was saying at the end, I remember a student one day taping on my door a little cartoon, and the one student is saying to the other, this teacher knows a lot about church history. He's lived through most of it. <laughs> so uh, I sort of felt that you were kind of uh, getting at that, Bob. Our subject again is Contemporary Movements Christian Renewal. Last night we tried to look at the Methodist slash Pentecostal heritage. Tonight we come to Evangelical Anglicanism. I think for many of us, the Methodist and in its more modern guise, that kind of Christianity, Pentecostalism, and what flows out from it, is really not where many of us are at. We are interested in it, or we jolly well should be. If we're interested in Christianity in Canada, it's the most vital movement going. But uh, for many of us, it's not just where life is lived. So it may not be too relevant. But I hope what we will talk about this evening may resonate with many of us. We are talking about a church experiencing renewal, which is a historical denomination. It's been around for a long, long time. So have the Atlantic Baptists. And there may be a chance of some mutual self-understanding here. The Church of England, and it's evangelical Anglicanism in England that we're talking about, is an established denomination. And I'm just not using that word in the technical sense of the state-church relationship, although we will have to speak about that, of course, to understand it, but established being accepted by society, having a place in society with all of the nominality that goes with it. And I've heard from a few people in the last day here that Atlantic Baptists in some areas can be characterized or afflicted by nominality. Again, one may find some parallelism, some help, some guidance here. And the third thing I would say, there are probably others that might make it relevant, is that the Church of England lives in one of the most secularized parts of Western culture. And I think there are those who would say that renewed Christianity, vital Christianity, is possible in two-thirds world societies which are animistic and unsophisticated and uh, therefore they will see Christianity as kind of a step up the ladder. But we cannot and we should not and we must not expect that Christianity is going to be renewed in the secular or neo-pagan world of Western society. We would only be opening ourselves the terrible disillusion and discouragement if we were. And yet, I think there are many things happening in the Church of England in England, and particularly in that section known as the Evangelicals, which tend to say remarkable things can happen in churches in our most secularized area. Now let's go on and say a little bit more about the Church of England as background. And maybe I'll say too much here because I've spent a lot of my life studying this and you try to boil that out into a few pages. Anyway, let's take a crack at it. It is an established church. Now here using that word in its more precise sense, a state church. It is a segment of Christendom, all these words having precise meanings, that close linkage of church and state which goes back to Constantine in the 4th century, which became the pattern of Christian organization in Europe throughout the Middle Ages, 
in the form of Roman Catholicism, and at the time of the Reformation, many of the national Protestant churches of Western Europe adopted the Christendom model of that virtual interpenetration of church and state, or church and state, as in other images, are two sides of the same coin. In the German principalities and throughout Scandinavia, these churches were known as Lutheran. In some of the Swiss cantons in the Netherlands and in Scotland, they were known as Calvinist or Reformed or Presbyterian, all meaning virtually the same thing. And in England, known as Anglican. If you've studied church history, these three entities, these three Christendom church, state churches, are often called the Magisterial Reformation. Now that Christendom is being dismantled, it's fascinating to compare what's going on in today's world with what happened in the 4th century in the Roman Empire when Christendom was being built. And almost month by month you see some decision made by some level of Canadian government that is just a bit more dismantling Christendom. Some people argue it's a bad thing. Some people argue it's a good thing. Uh, we're not here to pronounce on the merits or demerits of Christendom, but we are here to say, of course, that it is being taken down in our day. So when you say the Church of England is a state church, it doesn't mean what it once meant but it still means that the Anglican Church has a unique position, recognized by everyone, atheists included, as an essential entity of English history, identity, and culture. The whole country is still divided into parishes, with an Anglican Church building there and a clergy, maybe say, serving a few parishes in our day, but there they are. There is not a cubic centimeter of England that is not divided and encompassed by a parish. And the clergy person has responsibility, at least theoretically, for the spiritual well-being of everyone within that parish. The church's leaders, officially and unofficially, have ready access to the corridors of power. It is fascinating if you spend any time in England and you see the secularization of society and yet on every serious issue the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Archbishop of York, some other uh, bishops and perhaps some academic theologians from Oxford and Cambridge will be asked to comment, asked to comment. and it is not like it would be in Canada perfunctory. They want to hear what these people have to say because they believe they represent something that is absolutely essential to English society and to English life. The upper classes of society, they be they aristocracy or the land-owning gentry, have some traditional and very strong traditional links with this church. The Anglican Church is still heavily involved in the education of the upper middle and the upper classes in what we would call the private schools and what the English, in order to do everything different, call public schools. All of these have their chaplains and their chapel services and still that whole body of people who will assume it's gathered some eminent place in English society they are all getting some kind of dose of the Church of England. The ancient universities of Oxford and Cambridge, exactly the same kind of thing. The Church of England is not only an established denomination, it is a very large denomination. Today, having some 12,000 clergy, Atlantic Baptist Convention, what have you got, 500? It's fairly near. So something that is 24 times as large as you are in clergy, that's quite a sizable body, simply thinking of clergy. 
Some two million people are assumed to be fairly much involved in the life of this church, and of course millions more are linked by ties of baptism, confirmation, family, and history. The next thing, to use a time-honored phrase, it is a comprehensive church for which I suppose the nearest present-day equivalent would be a pluralistic church. Well, plural doesn't quite hit what we want, but it probably is about the best we can do. Ever since the time of Elizabeth I and the Elizabeth, Elizabethan succession and the Elizabethan Protestant development, the Church of England has tried to provide a home a spiritual home for every Englishman. Now, of course, in our more secularized day, and with the removing of some elements of the establishment, personal choice, personal religious persuasion has to be allowed in here. But still, the Church of England, by its very nature, tries to include everyone who in any way would want to be a part of it. In its comprehension, there are three distinct sections of the church, which today are usually called on the one hand the high church, which emphasizes the Catholic tradition. Realize they will argue that the Church of England was there long before the Protestant Reformation, and that what carried on after the Re Reformation had strong ties of continuity with the medieval past and even get a way back into the Celtic missionaries and all sorts of things. There is that tradition, a very strong sacramental kind of Catholicism without the Pope, no Pope, but a very Catholic called high church emphasis. There is also the broad church, which seeks to make what is considered to be an adaptation of Christianity in line with philosophical and societal shifts. So it seeks to be that which is particularly sensitive to the present mood and to adapt in some way Christianity to that. The third is the ones we are talking about. They are referred to as the evangelicals, who are therefore known to stress the authority of the Bible the centrality of Jesus Christ crucified and risen, the reality and necessary of personal faith and conversion, and a life of active discipleship. With this kind of comprehension, the Church of England has no official theological colleges or missionary societies. Now it is hard for us as North Americans with uh, our love of tightly knit ecclesiastical structures to realize how a church can get on this way. But we all know of the old English policy of muddling through. Now nobody else should ever try it because it would drive you bananas. But if you have grown up in that kind of society, which in many ways these are medieval relics, uh, I don't mean things you worship, but it's the medieval inheritance from a long distance society, it works for them. So all theological colleges, all missionary societies are run by representatives of these various interest groups, you might say, in this very comprehensive and pluralistic situation. I don't think one would ever understand the evangelicals and how they survive and thrive in the Church of England without realizing they run their own seminaries. They run their own missionary societies. So often in North American history, great battles have been over the missionary society. That's split denominations and all kinds of things. It can't happen because you may not like what one missionary society is doing. Well, toddle off and start your own. Uh, but you're still within the fabric uh, of the denomination. A very, very different situation than we have in North America and often takes us an awful long time not only to understand, but kind of emotionally uh, to be able to relate to. Also, we ought to say, it has been a church with a required liturgical order. 
for its services of worship. An order which at least many of its supporters would want to say is a very biblical order. And through constant repetition, it is believed really gets into the minds and spirits of people. It is in the interesting in the early days of the evangelical awakening, say in the mid and late 18th century, the few evangelical clergymen of the Church of England were around would often be complained to lustily by people who were saying in their community they were leaving the Church of England because the gospel was not being preached. And the usual classical answer was, if you don't get the gospel from the pulpit, you will certainly get it from the lectern where the prayer book was used. There would always be Bible Christianity there. But it is liturgical. And so the use of the prayer book has been a distinct part of the heritage of all sections of Anglicanism. They would all agree on using that. They had to, but I think fairly willingly all use it, and none more than the evangelicals who were very, very committed to prayer book liturgical worship. Also, there is a great deal of freedom in this kind of church. Far more freedom, I think, than normally we get in North American churches. Now again, it's hard for us. I mean, here we are, North Americans, we are the bastion of freedom. But uh, I don't think it really works out that way. We usually have pretty tightly knit ecclesiastical bureaucracies, and if you don't fit in, you really feel the screws. Not so in England. Bishops really have very little legal power. They have a lot of moral suasion. But, for example, there is an ancient medieval, I suppose we would say anomaly, and that is the parson's freehold. Once a clergyman is inducted into a parish, unless he tries to blow up the Houses of Parliament like Titus Oates on the 5th of November, or he tries to shoot the queen, nobody, bishop, archbishop, nobody can get him out of that parish. He is there for life, or as long as he wants to stay. An astonishing freedom. When I think, as a Presbyterian minister, the pressure I have sometimes felt from elders, let alone higher bureaucracies, and what I think I've heard from some Baptist colleagues about diaconates, particularly if they're somewhat fractious, uh, this is a very interesting free situation where the clergyman has very, very little to press upon him. Then the sections of the church, and we're talking about the evangelicals, also operate under the system of patronage. And this is again an old medieval system whereby people of wealth and position in the community may buy up the right to appoint the clergyman to the local parish. Now that sounds about the most unspiritual, undemocratic thing I've ever heard. Uh, the problem is, uh, many of these groups have milked that for all they're worth, because that guarantees that they are able to control who the clergy will be. And so down through the generations, a congregation will be high church, it will be broad church, or it will be an evangelical. And that will never vary because the people who hold the patronage will decide who is going to be the clergyman of that congregation. And they have all sorts of ways of tying up the control of that patronage. So much for Anglicanism in England in general. Remembering that not everything said applies to Anglicanism in other countries. Uh, just, it doesn't. And so one has to be very clear about that. Now let's say a little bit about this business of evangelical Anglicanism. Let's get a little closer to our subject tonight. Again, I think it is often difficult for people from other parts of the world to conceive that there can be such a thing as an evangelical section of the church like the Church of England. Some would say a church is comprehensive and pluralistic. No way. Some will say a state church. No way. And yet, I would want to suggest this is exactly 
what happens. Uh, then you might speak of your maritime background here. Certainly in Canadian church history, uh, Nova Scotia is considered as old-fashioned high churchmanship in Anglicanism. There are the exceptions. There's St. Paul's uh, and Trinity in Halifax, but I guess these are the exceptions that prove the rule. Uh, in New Brunswick, it's always assumed uh, that it represents a not an old-fashioned high churchmanship, a 19th century, mid-late 19th century Tractarianism. Very, very high church indeed. And now, of course, there's the Stone Church in St. John, and you get, again, your few exceptions, but there aren't very many. So it might be very easy for a person growing up in uh, Nova Scotia or New Brunswick to say, I have never heard of such a bird as evangelical Anglicanism. But all one can say is, be assured, in England there's lots of it, and in other parts uh, of the world as well. However, this should not be true of people in Acadia. If I have read Acadia history properly, I remember that the founders in 1828 were Anglicans who had left St. Paul's in Halifax, not, I think, because they were disagreeing with being Anglicans, because the bishop would not give them a gospel preacher. And as a result, they hiked down the road to the Baptist church. Now, I'm sure they became more and more Baptistic as time was on, uh, but still, it was these people used to position in the colonial society of Nova Scotia, who, if I understand it correctly, were absolutely key in the founding of Acadia. So I hope you will have some kind of sympathy with this matter. Um, as far as books are concerned, very little good bibliography on evangelical Anglicanism. There have been a couple of books written in recent years, Hilson Smith's The Evangelical Anglican, 1734 to 1984, Randall Mar Mannering's uh, 20th Century Study from Coexistence to Cooperation, uh, but neither really are very good history. We have uh, Peter Hawkins, Streams of Renewal. Uh, uh, again, he's a Roman Catholic, interesting. Uh, and I'm not sure he quite gets the feel of some of the people he's talking about. So we look forward to lots being produced by people on this very important subject. Now, as far as the history of these evangelicals, uh, well, they claim in many ways that they're the kind of Reformation section of the Church of England. Soon after the Reformation, the Puritans begin to emerge, and let's remember that the first two or three generation of Puritans are loyal Anglicans. It's only when they get booted out in the great ejection of 1662 that they become Presbyterians, Congregationalists, or in a few cents, Baptists. Uh, but, of course, Puritanism has its great decline in the late 17th and early 18th century. And so it's not until the 1730s that we begin to get a renewal movement starting in the Church of England. George Whitfield, John and Charles Wesley, because of the affinities, the latter two, with Methodism, we sometimes forget that Methodism was an Anglican renewal movement. That's what it started as. But for many reasons, part the Wesley's feeling that the world was their parish and they could not be inhibited by the parish structure, just being prepared to serve within a parish. Therefore, over time, Methodism became clearly distinguished from the Church of England. But by 1790, by the end of what we were calling last night the first evangelical awakening phase, a quite clear body of evangelical Anglican clergy are in existence. About 300 of them, it's assumed by 1790, scattered all over the church. In a church with that time had about 20,000 clergy. If there are 12,000 today, there were almost double that in those years. So they were a tiny, tiny group. Talk about the day of small things. It would be hard to see that written out 
any more clearly. Perhaps the most prominent member of these 300 evangelical clergy near the end of the 18th century would be John Newton, the incumbent of St. Paul's. But uh, the great hymn writer, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds, and all kinds of very basic and classical and traditional hymns, a great spiritual counselor by his letters in Cardiphonia, a preacher and a man of great vision. During the period of the Second Evangelical Awakening, which we said last night would be about 1790 to 1825, Evangelical Anglicanism expanded rapidly throughout many parts of England. There were two great leaders. One was a clergyman by the name of Charles Simeon. Simeon was a bachelor. There seems to be a long tradition in the evangelical Anglicans of bachelor clergy who seem to have been among their ablest, causing many people to wring their hands and saying, well, how wonderful if these men would get married and have big families. But they seem to have felt that God has called them to the celibate life, and they certainly have poured themselves into wonderfully effective ministry. So Charles Simeon is rector of Holy Trinity Church in Cambridge from 1782 to 1836, 54 years. Coming close to Mr. Harding, who I noticed in the list today at First Baptist Wolfville was there for 60 years. Well, long, long pastorates. It would be very hard to overestimate the influence of Charles Simeon at the heart of that great university in his remarkable ministry. The other leader, and what a leader he was, William Wilberforce, member of parliament, as one historian has described him, the moral conscience of the English-speaking world of his day. Uh, leaders, indeed, that this section had in the early 19th century. As has already been mentioned by Robert tonight, these men and a number of others with them became known as the Clapham sect, because a lot of them lived at Clapham near London. If you've spent any time in London, you know that Clapham Junction has more trains go through it than any other place in the world. What is it, every 13 seconds, a train on its way into London goes through Clapham. It's a, a rather grotty place today, but 200 years ago, uh, it was uh, very much of a beautiful suburban area. And so these men gathering together were involved in the founding of missionary societies, of evangelistic agencies, and of philanthropic groups beyond number. One historian has estimated that Wilberforce was on the board of 69 missionary, evangelistic, and philanthropic organizations. And that was not tokenism. He didn't marry till he was 37. It was estimated prior to his marriage he gave six-sevenths of his income away. It was a large income. Came from a very wealthy family. Gave him away to these kind of ministries. And that he gave a tremendous amount of his time to these agencies. So it wasn't token membership. It was deep, sacrificial, personal involvement. Not to be wondered at then that the great evangelical Anglican Missionary Society, the Church Missionary Society, the CMS, still existing today, became in the 19th century the flagship of Protestant mission. Missionary theology, mission methodology, mission practice was usually worked out first by the CMS. And then everybody in the world, mission movement, tended to buy it. Within this period of the early 19th century, the evangelical section of the Church of England, the clergy, will multiply ten times. 300 in 1790, about 1825 to 30, you're up to 3,000. By the mid-Victorian period, they had grown further to about 6,000 clergy. One of their number, J.B. Sumner, had become Archbishop of Canterbury. And there were many bishops and deans and archdeacons and other ecclesiastical officials from this section of the church. 
And then the great decline set in. The great decline of all evangelical groups and bodies from about 1890. And there is no point really in going in to the reasons for that in this kind of lecture, simply that it occurred. The period from World War I to World War II was the nadir of the evangelical Anglicans. To use our North American parlance, they hit rock bottom. As it was for so many evangelicals in pluralistic denom denominations, the numbers shrank. If there had been 6,000 evangelical clergy in the mid-19th century, it would be surprising if there were 2,000 by the interwar period of the 20th century. And more than half of those had moved on into what is usually described as liber liberal evangelicalism. So that the body associated with contemporary renewal today who were called often pejoratively the conservative evangelicals, might have mustered seven or eight hundred at most. A very tiny, marginalized remnant within the Church of England. Interestingly enough, although they were so marginalized, they loved the Church of England with an abounding love. They believed sincerely in their hearts that it was the most biblical and spiritual of churches. Now, some of you good Baptists wrestle with that one. But it's what they feel. Deep, deep in their psyche, in their hearts, in their minds. That it, it is such a privilege to be a part of this national church which seeks to honor God both internally in the life of the church and in and through society. But this was not the end of the story. What we have to come now to is evangelical Anglican renewal. We have to go back a bit. It's a long story of the last 50 years. And uh, anybody who has been at some fairly contemporary expression of renewal and says, oh, our movement is changing the Church of England. Hold on, buddy. Your movement has gone into a remarkably prepared situation that took a long, long time preparing. And only then have some of the more modern movements come into it. And maybe this is what is going on in the United Baptist Convention of the Atlantic Provinces, a long period of preparation. As we have said, this renewal starting about the end of World War II has taken place almost entirely among those known as the conservative evangelicals. Now, they retained their own theological colleges and missionary societies. And if they thought there was a drift in one theological college, they would just start up another. In fact, in the city of Bristol in the 1930s, they started two of them. Uh, but anyway, thus they kept themselves. And that, I think, is very important. They have their own infrastructure. They may be marginalized, but they're not totally bereft. They can carry on and do what they feel needs to be done. I don't think there is any question that the basic component of this renewal is concern about youth ministry. Where do you start if you're going to see a church renewed? These people seem to decide, and I think with amazing wisdom, capture the coming generation. A body of mature, devout, and attractive leaders who sensed a call of God to minister to young people began to emerge even in the late 30s. 
usually with a lifelong commitment and great effectiveness to working with young people. Many of these leaders and young people came from the upper middle to upper class. That was very natural, very different from North America, where movements of renewal are usually thought of lower middle to lower class. Uh, here they are upper middle to upper class. This just happens to be the cultural milieu, but I think it is important. There were the boy and girls crusader Bible classes held on Sunday afternoons in lovely upper middle class and upper class homes where boys or girls would be taught scripture and taken to summer camps and how much of what has gone on in more recent days goes back to those very important events. But I think pretty well everyone who's looked at the subject would agree the greatest ministry to youth was by a man with the nickname of Bash. His converts are Bash men. The great camp he conducted at Ewern Minster in Dorset is the Bash camp. His name was Nash. And I suppose you figured out how teenagers could get Bash out of that. Uh, he was a clergyman, a schoolmaster, came of a Jewish Christian background. Any pictures of him you've seen, if there were a crowd of three people, he would be missed. A most unimpressive looking little man. But Bash's vision was to reach young men from the top schools for Jesus Christ. He was a bachelor, so he could give his whole life to it. And so he ran this camp with the boys from Eton and Harrow and Winchester and Rugby and all of those top private public schools. The list of his converts and disciples is legion, but let me just give you some of the names. John Stott, <coughs> Michael Green, <coughs> Dick Lucas, David Watson, on and on it will go. John Stott states publicly that Nash wrote him every week for five years after his conversion where he was the head boy at rugby school. Nurturing this yet young man from a nominal Christian home whose father had been the surgeon to King George V. After Nash's death in the early 1980s, a correspondent to the Times wrote that Nash had exercised a greater impact on the Church of England through his converts and disciples than any other bishop or archbishop of that day and I never saw one letter to counter that. <coughs> Another very important ministry to youth is to students, and that is the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, a trans-denominational organization, but uh, these evangelical Anglicans have never been afraid of trans-denominational organizations. Sometimes denominations are. We sort of church and parachurch as if parachurch is outside the church I think we need other words church and parachurch are both part of the body of Christ and they need each other and they cross fertilize each other and help each other immensely and these people seemed I don't know why because they were strong denominationalists but they had some intuitive sense maybe because they had such a big hand in the university fellowship I don't know but anyway this movement among students, particularly at Oxford and Cambridge, helped to create a whole new generation of upcoming Christian leaders in the post-World War II world. I remember when I went to study in Cambridge in the fall of 1959, I was absolutely staggered to be taken along on my first Saturday night to the Bible reading. 
It was held in the debating union. Uh, a clergyman in his clericals and his dog collar got up to speak. I thought, this doesn't look very exciting. But the astonishing thing was there were 800 students there that night. And I said to myself, where in North America could you get 800 students to an exposition of scripture on a university campus? It probably was the first thing that shook me and made me realize that we North Americans often figure we are the ones who know how to do the work of the kingdom of God. And if anybody else in the world is going to do anything, he'd better learn it from us. How chauvinistic and pathetic that is. You go to many countries, you find Christians in their own setting are doing infinitely more effective work than we North Americans believe that we are doing. Within days, I discovered that the colleges of Cambridge were honeycombed with Bible studies and prayer meetings and Bible teaching sessions that some 1,200 students at Cambridge, almost 10% of the student body, were involved in this movement, by far the largest student group, as you might call it, on campus. This certainly had a very, very great impact. And of course, InterVarsity Fellowship began its work of encouraging writing and then providing publishing for biblical and theological works, kind of thing that Dr. McRae was mentioning last night when he said the evangelical Anglicans were the best writers he knew in our day on evangelism, so they have been in other areas as well. Also in 1954, there was the Billy Graham crusade in Haringey in North London. I suppose it would separate the men from the boys if we said who could remember that. Uh, I can, so I imagine some of the rest of you can too. The chairperson was about the only conservative evangelical bishop uh, of that day, Hugh Goff, the Bishop of Barking, but he was the chairperson of the Billy Graham Crusade in 1954, and lots of other evangelical Anglicans were involved. Many of these went into the Anglican parishes as lay people. Many, many others went on into the theological colleges and into the ministry. And if you talk today with those who are about retirement age, over and over and over again, I came to Christ through the Harringay meetings of Billy Graham. These are all part of the emphasis that is there. One particular item that I think is important in this whole renewal within the Evangelical Anglicans was the development of key congregations in almost every major urban area and nowhere more than in the university city. I think of the city of Cambridge when I went there not a large city, 115,000. Three of the center city parishes were strongly evangelical and evangelistic. And so that was crucial. Again, strategic thinking. This all just didn't, didn't happen. People decided that these kind of congregations should, as it were, be made use of in reaching the coming generation. And so it was done. And, of course, John Stott's All Souls Langham Place in central London was the most famous expression of this kind of congregation. But you found them everywhere throughout the country. Then ministerial societies began to emerge. And once again, John Stott. It almost becomes a record. John Stott, John Stott, John Stott from being probably the most hated man in the Church of England when I first went to England 35 years ago, I remember people at Cambridge just gritting their teeth and how this man and the young people he was producing would be ruining the Church of England. Today, he is expressed on every hand as the most important indiv single individual, not only in the Church of England, but in the Anglican communion worldwide. John 
gathered together a group called the Eclectic Society and he made one rule. He had to be under 40 years of age. A clergyman under 40. He was going to shape the new generation. Evangelical Anglicanism to the rest of the Church of England and to the country announced its coming of age at the Keele Conference in 1967 at the University of Keele. John Stott in the chair, a man now in Canada, James I. Packer, his key right-hand man in the planning. Amid all the papers and discussions, it was constantly stated and implied that the evangelical Anglicans were an integral and essential part of the Church of England. They could not be marginalized any longer. They could not be fobbed off. They could not be held back. And that they had the resources to effectively occupy a major position in the Church of England. Many were not happy about this from outside. Many looked askance at it. But there is no question that what took place at Keele has in considerable measure been fulfilled. Now, it's just about this time in the mid-60s that the charismatic movement comes to England, so we've got to say a word about that. Remember we talked about Pentecostalism and then the charismatic and then third wave. Pentecostalism had been a relatively weak movement in England and had virtually no contact with the Church of England or influence upon it. Now you may be ought to qualify that at one point, and that is it seems generally agreed today that the largest congregation of any kind, the largest Protestant congregation in England, for the last probably 20 years has been the Kensington Gospel Temple, which belongs to one of the indigenous English Pentecostal denominations, the Elam Church. But although it may be the largest soul congregation in the country, uh, you can't universalize off that. Uh, Pentecostalism had very, very little influence outside a restricted area. But it was in the 1960s that the charismatic movement began to appear in England. Demos Shakarian, if any of you know the name, the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International from California, Larry Christensen, a charismatic Lutheran from San Pedro, California, and the Episcopalian Dennis Bennett, who had moved from Southern California and was then in a parish in Seattle, Washington. But the Anglican response in England would be quite different from in America. In America, a more high church Anglican response in England from the evangelicals. How was it that this occurred? It seems to have been that certain of the up-and-coming younger leaders, men in their 20s and early 30s in the 1960s, were open to the charismatic movement. They all virtually were curates of John Stott's at one time or another, although John Stott for about 10 years was very strongly opposed to the charismatic movement, uh, as he said, on exegetical and theological grounds. Uh, I don't think he has ever altered his exegetical and theological critiques, but I think he has realized there are other levels on which a movement must be evaluated and uh, he has changed some of his attitudes. Anyway, a number of these young curates of his welcomed this movement. The first was the Reverend John Collins, who in the mid-60s had left London and was the rector of St. Mark's Gillingham at Rochester in Kent in southeastern England. This was the first parish in which charismatic worship and activity became an integral part of congregational life. Collins would then, in the 70s, move to a parish in one of the most wealthy parts of London, Holy Trinity Brompton, and more about Holy Trinity Brompton a minute later. 
Then there was Michael Harper. Michael set up the Fountain Trust. Most of these young men came from wealthy families. They had money of their own. They knew how to put their hands on money. He established the Fountain Trust, which became the center source of organization, encouragement, conferences, and so on for evangelical Anglicans touching the charismatic movement. He edited Renewal magazine for a number of years. Then David Watson came to the fore. Handsome, ramrod straight, a guards officer before he felt called into the ministry. Very articulate, creative, imaginative. He accepted an appointment to only the English could come up with this kind of word, a redundant parish. That's a honey, I think, a redundant parish. Uh, it means virtually non-functioning. It was in the city of York in the northeast of England, the northeast of England tending to be a spiritual wasteland. If you've ever been to the city of York, it is crowded with beautiful medieval churches, uh, far more than anybody would need in today's world. And there, David Watson, his first Sunday, I think, met 12 people. But he began his ministry. I have an old friend who, at that time, a Canadian, was head of the Graduate School of Architecture at York University. Uh, this chap had grown up in a very dour section of Presbyterianism. And uh, it was so strong that he could never get the monkey off his back. Have you ever met that kind of person brought up in a Christian background? They can't get rid of it, but they sure like to. And it makes them the most miserable people in all the world. I'd often wish dear old Bob would have become an atheist or something and got it out of his system. But there he had continued to go to church all his life, but grumbling and complaining. And if ever you sat down for a meal, he always got his cigarettes out and blew the smoke right in your face. He was saying something, some kind of a statement. Dear old Bob, I remember the first time I visited him in York. David Watson had been there about three years. And this was a new man, liberated in Christ, thanking God for what was happening in his life. He was so changed that he said, would you mind if I smoked? Golly, that was a whole new world. I couldn't believe such works of grace could exist. And, of course, David Watson became famous for his liturgical dance out in front of St. Michael's Church with the tens and hundreds of thousands of visitors every summer uh, going through the central streets of York and bringing them into the services. <coughs> his taking over York Minster, the great cathedral, and packing in 2,500 people some Sunday evening, starting off with 12 within a decade or so, drawing people from all over northeastern England. Then, of course, he took on traditional evangelistic campaigns and he reinterpreted them into celebrations. A lot of worship. Many of us have been greatly helped by David's books. I believe in the church and I believe in evangelism. That excellent phrase that the greatest form of evangelism in the world is a church truly at worship. The sense of God's presence and drawing. David, as some of you know, was diagnosed with cancer, passed away in 1982, just about at the peak of his ministry. The kind of thing that one is left with all kinds of questions about. By 1978, one of the Evangelical Anglican Theological Colleges could claim that 80% of its students had charismatic input into their Christian lives. Many of the other clergy were also buying aspects of the charismatic movement. This is something I enjoyed watching in England. Somebody would buy healing. Somebody would concentrate on exorcism. No other charismatic masturbation. Someone would concentrate on the new forms of music. On and on it went. Nobody seemed to feel as if they were being dragooned into anything. Uh, they were free to choose what they felt God was leading them to do. 
and what they should be implementing in their own ministry. Then there began to become changes in the liturgy. Now, of course, there has been what's been called a liturgical revival going on in more Catholic sides of Christianity for a number of years. But what happened here is that many of the evangelical Anglicans felt the traditional liturgy just wasn't where it was meeting people today. So they petitioned the bishop to let them write a congregational liturgy. And many bishops allowed them to do this. And so you get fascinatingly good and different liturgies now in various congregations. One of the greatest changes in music, where there was nothing but the organ and a surplus choir, now there may be a choir often wearing beat up old sweaters or maybe no choir at all. There will be a worship team. There may be many instruments in the organ or the organ may have been dispensed with and all kinds of instruments in evidence. The evangelical Anglican clergy are no longer wearing that white gown, the surplus, with their stole. Some of them don't even wear a clerical collar. The establishment becoming non-established. Fascinating. And they believe they're doing it to reach people for Christ. As one well-known friend of mine said to me one day when in his church he came up after and he was wearing a t-shirt and slacks and he was the sort of gentleman because of his school and his university and his professional position you expected a three-piece uh, three pinstripe. And he said to me, Ian, I hope you'll excuse me for wearing what I'm wearing this morning. I said, my dear Henry, you have no right to... <laughs> or reason to apologize to me or ask my forgiveness. Well, he said, you know, in our parish, a lot of men are coming to Christ, and this is all they ever wear, is T-shirts and jeans. I don't want to keep any man from Christ. Beautiful, isn't it? A new kind of freedom. Uh, you're more concerned about reaching others than you are about maintaining what may appear to be propri propriety and old standards. So there is this amazing new sense of freedom and yet still within the context of that church. I have sensed such freedom, such joy, such excitement in many of these congregations. And then came the vineyard. John Wimber, as you may know, was in England in 84 to 86 for a good period of time and he found a greater response among the evangelicals in the Church of England than anywhere else. Holy Trinity Brompton that we mentioned a few moments ago has now become the center. You have to line up to get in. Line up perhaps an hour and a half before services. And even our Canadian to whom we made reference last night, David Maines, said recently, that he encountered God in a new and living way, leaning against a pillar in Holy Trinity Brompton. The rector, Sandy Miller, and his assistant, Nikki Gumbel, both have the most glorious and plummy establishment accents you have ever heard. It's a bit of a joke in England that you have to have gone to Eton and Oxford to work on a staff at Holy Trinity Brompton. But this in no way holds them back from their vineyard enthusiasm, and both of them have spoken quite a few times at the airport vineyard in Toronto. And in the English press, if what goes on at HTB, as it's called, is ever criticized by some bishop or other official person, one or other of these chaps takes to the press and lets them know that God is blessing, and uh, they better keep a little quiet about some of their criticisms. Okay, a bit of conclusion. Here I think we have an example of renewal coming to the historical churches. 
And as we try to say at the beginning, it's coming to a large denomination in the midst of a secular culture. Why is it that the evangelical Anglicans have been able to absorb this new movement without all kinds of frights and fracture in themselves? Are they better Christians than a lot of us in North America? Uh, I think the fact that they've been a comprehensive denomination does help when century after century you get that in your blood that there are other people around who you may not agree with, but they do have as much right as you to be there. Maybe that helps. Uh, the fact that the Church of England, as our Calvinistic forefathers would have made them acutely aware of, was never very good at discipline. But maybe there are times that discipline is a bit harsh and you kick everybody out you don't like. Well, again, they don't have that history. And so, again, there is an element of live and let live. But it seems to me it is much more than cultural or historical. It seems to be that there have been a group of people with a vision for church and nation. And they have worked at the many, many ways we have spoken of. And when God has sent something new along, they've looked at it and they've chosen what they could use of it. Not all have taken everything by any means. But I spoke to my dear friend James Packer the other day when he was in Toronto staying with us as he usually does and we sit up half the night talking and uh, he asked me what I was going to be teaching, uh, speaking on here and I told him and uh, I said, Jim, with your comprehensive knowledge of the Church of England, even if you're living in Canada, what percentage of evangelical Anglicans would you say are influenced in some way or other by modern renewal? Oh, he said, easily, 95%. Just a couple of illustrations. The round church in the city of Cambridge. Have you ever visited Cambridge? Right at the heart, St. Sepulchre's. It was built by people coming back from the Crusades. They'd seen the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. So there, in 13th century Fenland, England, they built this church. It's had a strong evangelical heritage over at least the last hundred years. But in recent years, it has grown and grown and grown so that they can no longer meet there. They have taken over the debating union of the university right behind the church, and there, there are two morning services with the structure and yet packed new with so much that's fresh and vital. Excellent biblical exposition for which the round has always been famed. And young people comprising, I suppose, 80, 85 percent of the congregation. Another illustration in Cambridge, this time concerning the leadership. The Bishop of Ely, which is the diocese in which Cambridge resides, is a man by the name of Stephen Sykes, a former professor of theology in the University of Cambridge. We have dear friends in the city of Cambridge, Arthur and Doreen Bishop, who come from the Open Plymouth Brethren. When Arthur retired from business, a local Anglican parish asked he and his wife to run a halfway house for them. And so they spent about five years there. That became well known in the Anglican community. Then they went off to Wickham Market in Suffolk to pastor a little struggling brethren assembly. Came back from that after another five years. The first person on the phone was this Bishop of Ely, this theological professor, saying, Arthur and Doreen, I've heard you're coming back to Cambridge, could my wife and I come around for tea? Not what you usually expect, particularly to a denomination you would probably look down on. You probably would even call them a denomination of the brethren. The bishops do this, yes, when the church is experiencing renewal. And he said to Arthur, we have so appreciated your ministry among us, we would love to have you preaching in some of our vacant churches every Sunday if we could. This openness, this freedom, 
rather than we're all scared of each other because somebody might steal some of my sheep. Rather, everybody who's marked by the Lord Jesus, we just love to be part of them. It's the most refreshing thing. I, when I, Arthur told me this story in his living room, I, I could hardly believe it. How glorious, how wonderful that we recognize whatever God is doing and we just want to be relating to it. The third thing, Christ Church Clifton, Bristol. Again, the evangelical parish of long standing. We were invited to go there by friends one Sunday evening. We were out in the west part of England. Must have been a thousand people in the church that night. And there had been two services of a thousand each that morning. They said the university was not in term, and though there were not 400 students there on the Sunday night that there usually were, where they would have put them, I have no idea. There was a choir, there was an orchestra. There were two worship teams. The music leader was a converted Hungarian Jew who had music rolling out his fingertips. We worshipped and praised God in a most wonderful way for about two minutes. And then the young curate got, we graduated from Paul in Oxford, gave a serious half-hour exposition on the subject of apostasy according to Second Peter. And then we sang the benediction we went home. A glorious combination of life and truth. All together. Oh, I know it's not perfect. I know there's tension in arriving at these things. But I was glad I hadn't been in England for about 15 years. So I missed some of the hurdles. But to come and see some of the results and just thank God for what's going on. Old, historical, traditional churches in tough environments. We have at least one world in hope. They can be redeemed.